Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Uh, Robert, thank you and Photo Brigade for inviting me. And I wanted to thank um, Adorama again for providing the technology and the crew to make this all happen. It's pretty amazing. Uh, they're pretty awesome here. Um, so my name is Adam Brown, and I'm an underwater photographer, but that's not all I am. I'm actually kind of a, just a subaqueous guy. I grew up in New York. I grew up in the neighborhood, actually, right around the corner from Paragon Sporting Goods Store back in the 60s. So everybody asked me how I became a diver, how I started working in the business. It's because I used to live right around the corner from Paragon's, and I would go in and uh, look at their diving equipment, and I was kind of hooked. Um, so how do you work in the water in New York? Uh, you have to mostly leave New York at first. Uh, back then, the water was pretty filthy. Uh, I didn't really care. I mean, I had read somewhere that uh, water is the universal solvent, so I was trying to dissolve myself in it from a very early age. Um, I went to marine biology and oceanography schools, uh, took diving in high school, um, always wanted to be wet. I didn't quite know how. I thought I was going to be an oceanographer. I thought I was going to be a marine biologist, but I was bored with school after a while, decided I wanted some adventure, so I became a deep sea diver. Hard hat diver, big brass helmet, lead boots, and went down to college for that. And I spent my career back up in New York, primarily, swimming in the East River, using a chainsaw, uh, welding, underwater construction, underwater demolition, salvage, uh, bridges, piers, tunnels, that kind of thing. Um, I've been shooting underwater for years, since, uh, since the early 80s, but I was mostly doing technical photography. At that point, um, I had gotten away from art photography, which I had done as a child. I had my first darkroom when I was probably 13, but I never thought to be shooting underwater. It was really only when I had to do it for work, uh, and I'm, I can't show any of those photos because we were working in nuclear power plants, and I was doing technical photography in the cooling systems, reactors, uh, all that kind of thing, and they kept the images, wouldn't let anybody show them. So I have nothing really to show from my technical career. Um, I was a diver professionally for about 25 years and decided I was bored. You know, I can only swim underneath the FDR drive and uh, inspect that so many times before I need to do something a little bit differently. But while I'm down there and I'm taking these pictures, I'm, I, I spend a lot of time waiting and waiting for the surface crew uh, to give me instructions. And what do I do? I'm looking at light. So my underwater photos, uh, which I decided to start getting more involved in uh, in an artistic sense, came because I spent all this time, years, sitting down there looking at light, looking at the surface, looking how light you know, refracts through the water, looking how color dissolves and how color resolves, um, how you lose uh, the colors, the spectrum from just a few inches below the surface. And uh, I decided, you know, I'm already here. I might as well do something with it. So I started working in film and television. Uh, worse hours than working in marine construction, I can tell you. And uh, on the plus side, you get to work with, uh, with pretty people. And in fact, one of my models uh, decided to show up today. Uh, the images you're seeing right now are of uh, my model, Cassidy. And she's amazing. She's not a model. She actually works at the UN and she's in school at Columbia. And uh, but we were sitting around and uh, just playing with the camera and said, do you want to sit for me sometime? She's never modeled underwater. She said, sure, a natural. Now, it seems like it's not a big deal, perhaps, but when you're underwater, I hold my breath when the model holds their breath. So I don't use scuba. Um, I feel it's, I have a better connection with the model. Um, you know, we're closer, we can talk, we stay on the surface. We discuss what we're going to do, we choreograph it, and then when we're ready, we start breathing together, and then we both slip below the surface. 
uh, so as not to disrupt the surface of the water, and then we can't talk anymore, so I can no longer give any direction. So everything has to be done in advance, and Cassidy was amazing. From the first 10 seconds, we were getting shots that, uh, that I felt were usable. Uh, so speaking particularly about the uh, technology behind it, I shoot with the Nikon D800, um, but that's my preference for a job. I'll shoot anything, and typically, uh, they, the producers, have uh, an idea of some camera they want to use, so we have to use whatever they want. I also do underwater cinematography for commercials, TV shows, movies, that kind of thing. So I bounce back and forth between the two. This is, uh, this is my artwork, this is my own personal work that I'm showing. So I use the Nikon D800 in an underwater housing, and because what's different about shooting underwater than on the surface is one light gets absorbed so much quicker, it just falls off so fast, you can never get enough light. So the D800 I like a lot because it can see in the dark. Uh, these images I was actually shooting without strobe. I was using uh, some 4K uh, Lumen underwater video lights and they were being handheld by my underwater crew in the pool and I was shooting at about a 60th of a second at f5.6 or so. So there's motion blur in some of these. Um, I was shooting through a silk on one. I use multiple lights underwater. I like to shoot underwater in a pool like you would in a studio. So I stage it, I've got rim lights, back lights. Um, I have lights up above water in, the, in an interior pool. So I just increase the ambient light and then I start working different angles. Um, the kind of lenses that you typically have to use underwater are wides and super wides because you have to get close to your subject. Um, the water, even water that, that is crystal clear, it always has particulate matter in it. So the further away you get from your subject, besides the fact that the light falls off, um, you also wind up, uh, you wind up losing clarity of the image it's like shooting in fog. When you get close to somebody in fog, you can see them, but as soon as you, you move further away, more particulate matter is in between it, and it just starts to get fuzzy. So you have to get close. And when I say close, I'm shooting with uh, often a 16 fisheye, a 20 prime, 24 prime. I use uh, the uh, 16 to 35 zoom, but almost always at a, rect it's a, rect a rectilinear lens. I shoot at uh, about 18, uh, sometimes 18 to 20 on it. And I'm shooting just a, a few feet away, sometimes just a couple of feet away, um, unless I'm working you know, a particular angle or if the water is really, really clear. Um, oftentimes, though, you get into a pool and it's just murky and you got what you got. And even though they promise you a clear pool, you have to make do. So these were done, um, you know, I, I love going back and forth between these light, airy, ethereal kind of images where you've got magic lights coming in. There's, uh, in this one here, you've got this light slashing down from, could be the surface, it actually is, but I like to remove a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the items and, and appurtenances in a pool so you don't really know where you are. I like to change some of the laws of physics and bend your mind a little bit so you don't always know where you are and what direction you're looking at. The light doesn't seem to come from, from you know, up top. I bring it in from different angles. And uh, for example, in this one here, um, you know, she's, uh, this one is just kind of magical. And I like, I, I like my model sometimes playing with the surface of the water as a mirror. It becomes, it becomes a, an examination not by me as much as my model with her reflection in the water, which is sort of uh, an alter ego. And, you know, some of them are beautiful uh, and everything is in camera. I don't composite my, my images. Uh, the kind of retouching I do is mostly, is mostly color temperature, uh, a little light retouching in Lightroom, and uh, and then I 
global retouching, and then I bring it into Photoshop for just a little bit more uh, for removing things like strobes and, uh, and those things which are getting in the way of the image. But um, yeah, it's mostly, uh, mostly very light retouching, and, uh, and I like my models to kind of play with themselves in the, in the mirror. Um, by the way, if anybody has any question at any point about the technology, about process, about how long I can hold my breath, yes? Yeah, I had a tough time finding hair and makeup. <laughs> um, well, the hair is attached to the model, so I have no problem finding that. But, but <laughs> yeah, um, actually, I, I don't use uh, I know, hair person in our, but I do, I do use uh, makeup person uh, when I can, and we have to use waterproof makeups. And uh, you want to use cream-based, uh, you have to be careful with them. Uh, they can look really bad. You can't use powder, of course. Can't use dulling powders. But then again, most of the time you don't really need it because you wind up having the water, which acts as a diffuser anyway. You're, you're kind of fighting uh, you know, to get away from that. Um, the hair just becomes what it is. Um, what's interesting about it is when I'm shooting models with different color hair, like Cassidy here, she's got this long, luxurious black hair, which just goes everywhere, but it also sucks up light. And in these series, uh, they, it just seems like this, this black uh, lines going everywhere. You don't see a lot of detail, just absorbs all the light. Um, but it becomes, again, an interesting character in and of itself and terrific reflections. Um, Kids like this one because they think that I actually shoot mermaids, that I found mermaids, because she has no feet, so clearly she must be a mermaid. Uh, again, what I like about these, the image down below, you know, this is her, this is beautiful uh, expression looking into the light, but then her alter ego up above, it's kind of ugly, it's disturbing, it's, uh, it reminds me to a certain extent of these advertisements they used to do back in the 70s for alcohol and they would have in the ice cubes, they would, they would paint in really ugly monsters in the ice cubes. And I don't quite remember why, they had a reason for it, but that always kind of stuck with me. And uh, so as I'm underwater, I'm always looking at reflections and, uh, and, and these are the things that kind of move me. Um, and I like to get a little bit darker. Occasionally I explore, you know, people don't usually like this one because they're a little scary, but uh, you know, when I'm diving, I'm, you know, I, I lived in the Caribbean, it's beautiful, there's wonderful crystal clear water. I also dive in zero visibility water, it's dark, I work under the piers, you know, things are scary, you might bump into a body, um, I hate when that happens, but you know, you, you're, when you're under a pier in New York, you always think something's gonna come out and grab you. You know, if you're a kid and you watched uh, horror movies, yes. Do you have a time frame for every model and yourself starts getting too wrinkly where then it starts affecting the image? That's actually an interesting question. Um, as I was retouching some images and zooming in on a couple of them from the end of one shoot, I did have a model who had uh, some, some wrinkled fingers and it was a little bit of a problem. Uh, usually, it's not too much, you know, you can put uh, a little bit of lotion on uh, beforehand, uh, although I don't like any oils in the water, non-greasy, and that helps protect. Um, but yeah, it, it can be a little bit of a problem with that. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I really am somewhat attached to the, uh, the darker images. While the light ones are beautiful and easy to look at and they're pretty, um, the dark ones kind of resonate for me to a certain extent. And again, you know, the, occasionally as I'm shooting, uh, you, I, I remove the sense of up and down. You know, you've got this magic light coming from below, lighting it, and you don't really, you don't really have a sense. You know, physics doesn't seem to work anymore in my images, and that's that's kind of where where my comfort zone is in this is finding these slightly uncomfortable moments and, and showing them. And occasionally, the model uh, is not the subject, but the reflection 
is the prime subject, and the model is actually is is just kind of there. But but the actual prime sub uh, subject is is the reflection, as in this one. So this is from my falling series, and this is where I invert everything, and I, I'm creating a new world where, where a light is coming in from, again, different, different directions. It, it, appears, it appears that she's hovering over the water, or, um, her clothing, her hair is, is, is flying all different ways. It, it has a sense that she's either hovering there or about to fall. And, and these are probably some of my favorites. Um, at the same time, you know, she's, she's just quietly sitting, just looking at herself. Um, doing these images, it actually, it's, it's real easy. What we do is I have her take a breath and she holds her, enough air in her lungs so that she's going to be buoyant and then, but not, not terribly buoyant, just a little buoyant, and we practice this in the pool. And then when we're ready, I go down, and then she slips all the way down to the bottom, adjusts her hair, adjusts her outfit, or one of my underwater crew will do that, and then she'll slowly just lay back and start to float up to the surface and kind of play with the surface of the water, and as she's slowly coming up, her clothing are hanging down, her hair is hanging down, and doing whatever, and uh, and that's when I start shooting, till she gets to the surface, and at some point I cut, and then we we invert them, and that creates the uh, the effect. So this one is a prime example of why I like uh, a certain hierarchy in my underwater models. I typically prefer to shoot uh, dancers underwater because dancers are so used to being uncomfortable. Dancers' bodies are machines. Um, discomfort is their comfort zone. And so anything I ask of them, they can do. Next on the list is actors because actors get all method and, uh, and they play through. And even if they're not having a good time, they, they, they kind of make it work. But uh, this young woman, Rachel, is uh, not only is she a dancer, but she also was uh, a magician and she was an escape artist. And I found her in a sink down in the Lower East Side, actually. Um, she, was, uh, she was just washing her hands, but she moved in a way. I've, I've worked in dance for years. She moved like a dancer, so I asked her if she was interested in posing underwater if she could actually I asked her if she could hold her breath underwater which is an odd question to approach somebody with um, she turned around she looked at me and said do you know me and I replied no I should I she said yes because I'm a professional underwater model but not only that I'm also an escape artist and I worked in Vegas and I did the Houdini upside down chained up hanging by the feet in a water tank on stage, gag 200 times. So I'm your girl. And then I showed her my images and she said, I'm definitely your girl. Uh, and again, like Cassidy, she's amazing in the water. One of the things I didn't discuss was that's so difficult, it seems simple, but when I had Cassidy looking up at the surface of the water, tilting her head back and just floating up, well, water's running up her nose completely filling up. Anybody gets water up the nose, it hurts. I've been in the water for most of my adult life, and I'm really old, and I still don't like to do it. It hurts. Cassidy and Rachel, it's, it's, it's amazing. I'm in awe of how they can do it, and their faces don't reflect any of that, their discomfort. Um, it's those little things that uh, make you choose your models and, and it's also what makes it so important to not have an important shoot without having a casting in water because I've had models say you have to shoot me I'm perfect I'm so good in the water my nickname is starfish 
And then I find out it's starfish because I can't pry their hands off the edge of the pool and get them into the water because it's not what they really thought it was. It's a lot harder. It, it seems easy, but it's really, really difficult. And, uh, and the people who can do it just uh, I, I have such respect for. So this series, uh, it was part of a, a big shoot that I did with about six models. Um, I was, unfortunately, there's a couple I can't show you. I, I was doing some work with an underwater skateboarder. Um, those were, were still, you know, discussing selling. So until they get published, I, I can't show them. But uh, we had six models and we were, we were cycling through them. And this is part of that series. This little girl, my tiny dancer, is amazing. She was nine and she was dancing with, uh, with New York City Ballet. And we had been talking, her and her father and I, about putting her underwater and doing, doing a dance program. And again, like Cassidy, she's amazing in there. And we, we decided to do a couple interesting things. And again, use the water like the mirror that she's rehearsing and uh, dancing for the mirror. And uh, it's, it's one, of my, one of my favorites. And again, back to, uh, again, um, Rachel. Um, you may have noticed I, I changed lighting around. I love lights and, and colors. I worked in theater for many years. I worked in the opera, built scenery. I ran shows. So I love theatrical lighting. Um, I like to bring that underwater as much as possible. I love bringing rim lights and backlights. I love shooting into the sun when I shoot above water. And I like to do the same thing underwater as well. And it creates some amazing, uh, uh, amazing shadow silhouettes and, and uh, just very dramatic effects, which, which I find appealing. Um, you know, this pool is a small pool. It's only uh, where she was, about 20 feet by 20 feet. So everything I was doing was to remove all sense of the body of water and then, uh, and then shoot her. And these have a sense of, of motion and this calm, you know, she's resolved to do, do her, her, her moves. And I just think it's, uh, I think this one is, is lovely. Um, I have her working with the underwater skateboarder for this series of shots. Uh, again, it's, unfortunately, I can't show you those, but these are, uh, these are, are some of my favorites. And, um, you know, when, when I get a good model on, uh, on a shoot, I put them in my roster because there's always things coming up. And if we're shooting a commercial or the TV show, um, they always, they always want to bring in talent, but they never have talent that's, uh, that they've tested. So I like to have a roster of tried and true uh, models that I can work with. Um, so speaking of work with, my crew, when I'm on a shoot, I have myself, I have an, a camera assistant who is a wet camera assistant, and I have a dry camera assistant because buttoning up the camera requires somebody's hands to be completely dry. If I have a, I'm having a wetsuit on, if I reach in and I get a couple of drops on the camera, can sizzle it, I'm out of, out of work. Um, so one guy stays dry, he, he handles that, and then they get it into the water. We do, we do uh, leak tests. I've got uh, typically one person on every light. And, and the reason is I, I've tried putting them on stands, but because light falls off so quickly underwater that the models, when they're in there, they can't see what they're doing. So they can't, you know, when we put them on a mark, they can't hold it very long. They start drifting around as they're doing their choreography and they'll drift out of the light and they drift out very, very quickly. So I found that it was easier to have, uh, to have my models uh, being followed with uh, these follow spots with someone on every single light, which sometimes means I have to have five or six people um, in the water or hanging over the water with, uh, with a light and uh, dealing with it that way. This is a, this image, um, I spent a lot of time in the Metropolitan Museum and I love the old Renaissance paintings 
anything from that time, the Caravaggio, any of these, these beautiful scenes where you have these nymphs, they're, they're lounging about, they're on top of each other, there's animals, there's these wonderful, wonderful tableaus. And I, I go there and I get inspiration for lighting and for posing for, uh, for some of these. And I have another series that I, I'm looking to do um, based on this, uh, on this kind of lighting and, 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 this, and this mood. Again, this is part of my falling series. And, and what I like about these, they're not beautiful per se, but there's, there's a symmetry, there's a, it's an in-between moment. It's uncomfortable, it's disturbing in a little way, and, and those are the moments that, that I find often most interesting. And, and this particular uh, model was perfect for it. She, she really, she had, she had an intensity about her, a uh, serious quality that she wasn't, she didn't want to do things that were just too pretty. She was, uh, she was, she wanted to explore some other uncomfortable areas. Um, they almost look like they're dead, uh, the way I light them. And it's not a reference to when I bump into them in the river, but at least not intentionally. <laughs> um, they're, more, they're more connecting again with their, with their um, alter ego. And again, they're, they're aware of each other. And, the, and their alter egos here some of them are, you know, they're, they could be ugly, but like this one, she's really quite beautiful. She's, got, she's kind of a bit of an alien, but there's something quite beautiful about her and compelling. And I, I find myself staring at the alter ego and, uh, and, and wondering, you know, what the conversation is between the two of them. I, I run scenarios in my head. I, I have way too much free time on my hands, I think. Um, it's the life of an artist. Uh, and speaking of, I, as I said, I grew up in the, in the arts in New York. My father was a painter. He was an abstract expressionist. So if that gives you any sense of the way I look at light, I grew up watching my father paint. And he had wonderful, broad, loose strokes. Uh, he painted very large uh, pieces. And one expressionist stroke might be six feet, and he would grab a brush and walk across the canvas with it. He would attack it. So that's my experience. Uh, that's, my, uh, that's where I'm comfortable with, with wild strokes. They don't have to, they don't have to be uh, real. I don't require my lighting to be real. Theater lighting is, is not perfect. It's not, it, it, blues are, you know, it's based on a mood that I'm creating. I don't need skin tones to, to be to be normal, um, shadows don't need to be normal. I find, again, it, it, it removes you from, from reality by, by not forcing you to have anything real. The one thing I, I do also, is you may have noticed in a lot of my photos underwater here, there's none of that ripple effect, those shadows, the ripple shadows on any of the skin and the clothing of my, my models because that would indicate light coming in from the sun from up above and that allows you to place it and I want to remove all that so that you're you don't go oh okay well she's turned sideways but there's the ripple so up must be this way because that must be sunlight I want to get rid of all of that and have you experience it just for what it is and in this case she's she's talking with her her Vivek which actually has three faces and okay, and to wrap up, this is uh, my last image. Um, as, as, as uncomfortable as I like my models to look underwater, I also uh, commercially I, I need to have things that are pretty, and uh, if I want to do commercial work, so I try and have everybody uh, sit for at least one. But again, I always I like blowing out the lights. I like uh, you know um, I, I love I love backlighting. Um, so that's kind of it for what I wanted to show. Now I don't just shoot underwater, I shoot above water and the way I shoot is uh, everything is difficult lighting wise. I'll shoot action, I'll shoot 
bands and bad lighting. I'll shoot skateboarders. I'll shoot children skateboarding or dogs because it's all, for me, practice to work in a difficult environment. Um, with that, anybody have any questions? Hmm. Yes. Uh, how do you find the uh, locations, like the pools and such, in New York? It's difficult. Um, in LA, they have about a dozen dedicated film tanks for any purpose, and you can, you can rent them and, and schedule blocks of contiguous days. Uh, in New York, we don't have that at all. Uh, I use a pool out in New Jersey at Cedar Grove. It's a dive shop at Cedar Grove Divers, and they have, they have a deep tank. It's set up for, for diving. It's not the nicest pool uh, for high-end shoots, but, uh, but I can at least uh, book a day, and it, it works for me. There's also a tank up in Connecticut, but now you're leaving the city, and it takes two, three hours, and that becomes problematic. Yeah, it's an issue. We lose work because of it. In fact, you had a question? For the reflection, do you have a dark surface? Not always. It, it is more to do with the, the way the light, the angle of incident and the angle of reflection of the light bouncing off, and, and that changes. Uh, yes? It looks like you're shooting in rapid fire. Find yourself overwhelmed at the end of the month, end of the year. How many images you've shot, and do you call your images, or do you find yourself just saving everything? I tend to save most everything except ones that are technically completely unusable, uh, because what I thought initially when I'm pulling selects, and if I'm doing a shoot with one with one model, typically a session will be about 800 to 1,200 images, and then we pull maybe 15 selects from that, and we might use three. Um, but uh, that would be for a campaign. But for my art, I find that when I, when I come back months later, an image that I thought was just unusable, I find that it means something completely different to me, and I can't believe that I overlooked it. So I really I, I like to save as much as I can. Being that the cameras in the house, do you find it time consuming? try to check an image, focus, to, to know if you nailed it. Yeah, and that's a problem, and uh, because not only is it in the housing and you know there's separation, you can't see, the water's murky, I'm wearing a mask that might be getting foggy because I'm shooting a lot. I keep the pool at about uh, 90, 92 degrees for the model so that she's warm and uh, so that there's no goosebumps because rimlet goosebumps underwater are impossible to remove. And plus, the, the model's just not comfortable, and she's going to be cold, and she's just not going to be able to work effectively and relax and hold her breath and, uh, and perform. So it's, uh, yeah, it is difficult. What I like to do is shoot tethered if I can, and if not tethered, then we'll take, we'll shoot for a while. I try and overshoot, and then we'll bring it out, and I always have a 27-inch uh, iMac on set, and we load them in, and I have a Digitech who is checking them for critical focus, and while well, we start shooting, and also so that the uh, the models can see what they're getting, and uh, we can give a little feedback. Right. Anybody else have any questions? I think we're running late. And, uh, All right, everyone, give it up for Mr. Brown. Cool.